let's okay so today we're going to be uh uh building off of your readings and 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 viewings we're going to be getting into some of these key themes that we will see um uh, reflected across the semester as we get into individual stories individual examples uh individual case studies um so we started this uh last week um and then it continued on your readings but as a reminder the the big conceptual idea of what we mean by a disaster is when a, a hazard um, manifests itself and that hazard manifests manifests itself in a bad way um, and has some negative interaction with us meaning you personally or your family or your community or something that you directly care about to the point that say maybe, maybe your crops, maybe your family's farm or something of that nature. So, um, and that negative interaction is to the point where you are um, overwhelmed by the consequences. And that's what we call a disaster. Now, as with all foreign languages, right, this, this field of of disasters and, and disasterology and disaster science and, and emergency response and all these sort of related things, um, the bureaucracy is thick uh, and, and, and or can be very thick, can be easy to get bog, bogged down in terms. So this is just a, one little um, example from a, a recent paper and it's, what the hell is this? I, I, I loathe, when this stuff comes up, I just, I cringe. It's like, wait, what? There's like a circle, but then there's lines, but then the, from the lines, there's boxes and there's somehow, and this is supposed to be very organized. It's supposed to be very smart. This stuff never comes off as smart to me. I, I, don't, I don't really understand the, um, the logic here. Uh, it, it, it sort of looks fancy or it looks like you've done a lot of stuff, but at least the way my brain works, this, isn't, this, this type of stuff isn't particularly helpful. Um, obviously, we do need the bureaucracy. We do need the organizational structures when we're trying to respond to these um, events. Um, and so, so we need these institutions, but um, just remember that, that uh, this is about bad things happening and our efforts to try to make those bad things be a bit less bad. Um, so this is a... a a gentleman who's experiencing a disaster, right? And this is what's important to keep in our head, that um, the terminology is important, definitions are important, but um, we don't want, sometimes in the bureaucracies in places like uh, Washington DC or places like uh, Geneva, Switzerland or whatever, they can sometimes get lost. And we need to always remember that these, this is what we're doing this for is to help out uh, this, this gentleman and, and, and folks like him. Having said that, here's a bunch of terminology. <laughs> here's a bunch of definitions. So um, some of your readings had some definitions. I, I think the, the most, generally speaking, the most um, universal terms are going to be the ones that are in, in recent, in the recent last decade, 15 years or so, have been codified by the United Nations slash World Health Organization. We'll have slightly different ones in the U.S., maybe um, uh, codified by FEMA uh, or some other country might have something slightly different. But um, but we'll start with the U.N. WHO terms because those are generally the most universal, the most applicable. Um, OK, so as we mentioned, uh, hazard, hazard and risk. So first, let's let's contrast those two things there. Right. So as we mentioned before, a hazard is a process, a phenomenon, uh, something you and I did that will cause bad things to happen. So that could be loss of life, that could be somebody gets seriously hurt, um, what have you, could be property damage, could be economic disruption, could be environmental degradation. So the hazard is just the thing, the, 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 the potential happening of the thing. Um, the risk is the probability that that hazard will actually occur and, and produce a bad effect uh, for you uh, or, or for whomever. So hazard's there, risk is there. 
the key thing with risk is um, it is a forecast. It is a prediction. It's based on uncertainty. We don't know. So it's a probability-based um, description. Uh, with that hazard, and it, and it has some level of risk, uh, and then and the risk is both um, how frequently it might happen, but then also if it does happen, how catastrophic it would be. Um, and that, that together, when, when the event actually happens and plays itself out, that's what we call a disaster, right? So, so here, the, the definition I have for you of, of this formal definition. Of, so this one, this definition, I think, is the most useful kind of generically, right? When, in our head, I would say this, uh, this idea of, of disaster is useful um, to really convey the, the main nut of it. However, this is the, the UN definition of disaster, a serious disruption of the functioning of a community or society at any scale due to a hazardous event or events interacting with conditions of exposure, vulnerability, capacity uh, that lead to bad things with people, uh, physical material flows, uh, economies, or environmental um, or the surrounding environment. Uh, another one that uh, we're gonna talk about and then mostly gonna ignore for, or I should say, um, ignore the distinction for the rest of the class, but just for completeness, I wanted to put it in there. Sometimes people distinguish incident and event. So some of these, for example, UN definitions or FEMA definitions might say incidents or events. I don't, I don't really see the difference between them, but, but we do have a definition here. So an incident is an action or event which, which causes something. Uh, a hazardous event is a manifestation of a hazard in a particular place at a particular time. So uh, I would say pick whichever one is your favorite. If you like to use the term, uh, you know, the incident or the event, they're, they're pretty much interchangeable as far as I can tell. Um, cool. Questions about that. So we have hazard risk disaster, and then we have incident or event. Cool. Okay, I'm gonna assume we're, we're good since I hear no questions. Um, I'll leave this up for a second. Um, uh, recall again that um, we are recording our, our Lecture. So generally speaking, I try to avoid putting huge, heavy, you know, massive, heavy text definitions like this in here. But in this context, is actually these are important. So I want to make sure you guys have these. Recall that once we have our lecture up and online, you can always go back and review and and, and look at the, the specific terminology, etc. Okay. Okay. So then um, let's talk about some of the different manifestations of or, or different aspects to disasters, etc. Um, we don't, or at least there, there isn't a, a clear definition of these three things. This is rather a, a, a spectrum of intensity, basically. And so um, mostly, we will default to using the term disaster. But um, what's becoming clear is more and more um, emergency management professionals, um, folks that, that specialize in disasters are coming to use sort of this, this graded scale. So emergency would be a relatively um, circumscribed event, relatively narrow in space or time, relatively few people impacted. Disaster, much, uh, you know, larger spatial impact lasting for a longer period of time. And then a catastrophe, and sometimes people will say a major catastrophe, you might see that in, in like a newspaper story or something. That's gonna be even, even larger and, and more impactful. So what do we mean by that? So an emergency would be, let's, let's take a fire. Let's say we have a, a wildfire and, it, and my house is on the edge of the field and the field is on fire and it, and it threatened my house and it caught my house on fire. That's a, that's an emergency, right? That, 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 that's a, that hazard has manifested itself in my house or, or on my property um, or impacting my family, right? That's a real thing. And um, so we call that emergency. 
if instead that wild that that grassland fire not only hit my house but hit my neighbors hit the church hit the school hit the shopping mall all that kind of stuff right hit my whole community that would be more of a disaster right and then if it was something more of, on the lines of uh some of our larger wildfires that we're seeing more and more of like the thomas fire or something of that nature that impacted my whole region um we would call that um a catastrophe right and so some people will focus on monetary uh measures here or or, or the the economic impact some people talk about the number of people some people talk about the geography of scale but regardless it's a continuum Again, we will default to using disaster as just sort of our, our generic term for these types of events. Um, but, uh, but do realize that, that there's, while not perfect yet, we are moving towards a, a clearer definition of these, of these terms. The other thing to say is that, um, as with many things that we deal with in ESRM, ecological terms, competition, predation, et cetera, in this case, disasters, uh, emergency disaster, most of the terms we're using are common terms in our language. So, you know, you could say my shirt's a disaster, my, my outfit's a disaster today, right? So, so um, because we use more common terms, it's easy for folks to, to misinterpret. So that's why we're spending some time today to talk about these things so that we're all on the same page. That's not to say um, it's the worst thing in the world when someone call, calls their, their outfit a disaster, but it just leads to more, um, can lead to more confusion versus say the physicists or the astrophysicists, you know, they use quark and they use muon and they use, you know, quasar and stuff like that. And, and, and those aren't commonly used terms in our regular parlance. So it's very easy for those folks to um, have, have precise meaning when they throw out one of their terms because they're not in common usage. Cool. All right. Uh, wouldn't it sort of behoove us and in this sort of subject matter to use common terms because a lot of this involves like talking to everyday people about this? Oh, totally. Oh yeah, no, I'm not saying we have to invent our own special language, totally. Yeah, yeah no, that, that's good. I, I'm just saying that um, because it is, because we do use those common terms, it can get, it it can um, it can sometimes complicate the communication is what I'm saying. So so if I say this is a catastrophe, um, the general public might just I think a lot of times they see catastrophe and disaster and maybe even emergency as as interchangeable, right? And so I might say that to try to signal you know we're, the thermometer is really really hot, but because of the commonness of the term, maybe not everybody uh, gets that. Um, so yes, so, so, the, so uh, nature of the beast, but at least in our circles, we wanna make sure we understand what, what we're, what the implication when we use some of these terms. Good point, good point. Other comments or other thoughts so far? Okay, good, great, excellent. Um, um, okay, so the background of this whole idea of studying natural disasters, um, as I mentioned before, comes out of the um, out of the world of geophysics. People study volcanoes, uh, yeah, especially geological hazards. So, so landslides, earthquakes, volcanoes, that type of stuff. And, uh, and so that, that gave us, and we'll talk about this more in, in, a, in a little bit here, but this idea of natural hazard. And so there's um, traditionally in this discipline that's looking at these, these ideas, um, we've drawn a pretty stark delineation between natural things and human caused things. So, a natural hazard would be some latent property or some inherent ability of the environment to do something, right? In contrast, um, an anthropogenic, anthropogenic factor or, or, or disaster, an anthropogenic disaster or hazard um, would be something that was totally caused by people. 
and as we've seen, and as you guys have seen in some of your other classes, environmental literature, uh, uh, conservation biology, these, these, these different areas, um, we historically had people very much so, and, and for a, many respects, we still do, um, have our legal system and other things set up as if humans and nature are apart, right? And they're, they're sort of different realms. So if we talk about the types of hazards, the types of disasters that we see, um, the, the classic grouping would be uh, biological or abiotic. And, and so the abiotic ones, the geophysical, again, the earthquakes, that type of stuff, the hydro meteorological, the hurricanes, that type of stuff, or the extraterrestrial, the asteroid, that type of stuff. Um, those are, those are the, the, the common, those, those are the big heavy hitters. Um, and you'll see that the UN also defines environmental, environmental degradation. I, I have a hard time really um, understanding why they did that, but, but that, those, would, those would fall into the natural hazard dichotomy. And that would be contrasted traditionally with the human driven stuff. So this would be technological stuff or, or technological hazard, uh, perhaps um, uh, an oil spill, right? or a nuclear um, plant melting down and radiation you know, coming out from the plant, that type of stuff. Uh, societal disasters, socio-natural, uh, which is sort of interaction. All this stuff <clears throat> is um, now uh, codified in the Sendai uh, framework, which you guys have um, done some reading on now, which essentially is uh, was an effort by the United Nations to, co to, to standardize this language and to bring stuff together. Because this holistic definition was happening under the auspices of the United Nations, they've specifically called out a few things that we otherwise could, you know, intellectually, theoretically become a, a disaster or or, a ha or be a hazard or they're manifested as a disaster. Um, and those would be things related to um, human rights and armed conflict, laws of war and that kind of stuff. So, so by definition, those things are not considered an anthropogenic, <clears throat> anthropogenic hazard. Um, so again, the old way of thinking of natural versus, versus human caused. And so here's uh, a Dr. little- a? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, about the environmental degradation, maybe would they be referring to like um, uh, non-human cause, like erosion or like? Yes. Uh... Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. It's just Absolutely. those overlap a lot, so it gets weird. Yeah. So we'll we'll see it when I when I call up that that chart, but um, but yeah, exactly. So so you could say erosion would be a classic example of that, of 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 the UN's. Uh, environmental degradation grouping of hazards. Yes, good. O other questions or other things you guys are wondering about? Okay, cool. Um, so here's a cartoon from yesterday's newspaper uh, that uh, I thought spoke a little bit to this. So I'll give you guys, I'll give you guys a few seconds to read this. And it goes, it goes, uh, it's a it's left column and it goes down and then it goes up to the right. It was a long, it was one of those long panels that I, I it was too hard to fit in here. So I, I cut it in half so that it would fit better on the screen. So this seemed to be, uh, you know, am I Sunday, Sunday working on my lecture for you guys? This seemed to be, oh, this is perfect. It's brilliant. And you guys are probably think this is kind of stupid. This isn't very funny, whatever. Right. But, but the idea was that these guys were talking about something and they're like, oh my God, the world's ending and horrible stuff. And then this, this dude flies on in and, and ultimately it, it's really about what we just talked about. Right. They're saying that they're, they're, con they're confounding the human stressor, the human danger with the, the totally um, uh, uh, outside of human control, an asteroid coming in. And so again, that was so brilliant. I'm just so smart for putting this cartoon in there. And I just wanted to show you guys how, uh, 
how smart I am. Um, okay, so we'll do we'll do a couple more slides, and then we're going to um, and then we're going to pause because uh, we're coming up to our our hour break. Um, so picking up that idea, that idea of the natural hazards, the human caused hazards, or or, or, or human created disasters. Um, I want to talk very generally about how we thought about these things. Historically, we thought about many of these events as so-called acts of God. And this is most of our, of our history. And so that means when the hurricane happens, when the volcano blows up or, or whatever, um, this thing was uncontrollable, way beyond our conceptualization, beyond our understanding, and it just sort of played out. And we're just little ping pong balls getting knocked around here, right? And so here, over here is an image of, of Noah's Ark, right? So, oh my God, there's this massive flood. What can we do? We can't do anything about it. Don't know what's gonna happen. God tells Noah, hey man, there's, there's this flood coming. Grab all these critters, get your family, jump on this, jump on this boat. And like, okay, God's gonna flood. So I, we gotta go do this, right? Um, and in fact, people, the joke, a joke on, amongst um, disaster professionals is that Noah was the first emergency manager, right? Like, there's a horrible thing coming. He's like, oh my God, we got to get a boat together. <laughs> um, but, but again, disasters, can't do anything about them. They just happen, right? We're just a victim of these things and there's nothing we can do. By the late 19th and, and definitely in the 20th century, we come to a different type of uh, discussion and, and we talk, we start talking about disasters differently. And that gives us the term natural disasters and that idea of natural disaster. So this is um, a serious disruption of the dynamics, the functioning of whatever it is, shipping, uh, producing food, whatever, um, serious disruption um, that strikes without warning um, but, it, and maybe it's not seen as a, as a God cause thing, but nevertheless, it's something beyond our ability to predict, beyond our ability to influence. It just sort of, it just happens, right? So we've gone from acts of God to talking about natural disasters. And then the current era that we're in, we're, we're still sort of in this natural disaster um, uh, 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 way of thinking. We're just starting to move into this um, new phase, right? Which um, is not, not really, we don't have a great term for it yet. We haven't really codified it, but really um, uh, many professionals have come to this independently, but it's this idea that um, disaster is really a human thing, right? And so our influence on the planet is so large and is so ubiquitous that the the concept of a natural disaster doesn't really it it, it doesn't really make sense to talk about a quote unquote natural disaster. Um, so we ha definitely have natural hazards, right? So absolutely, that lightning strike that's happening, you know, is an is a natural thing, or the volcano that's erupting is is a you know force beyond humans, but the hazard is right as that hazard plays out, the disaster part of that is absolutely a function of this witch's brew of, of urbanized landscapes, of um, uh, uh, you know, transformed ecosystems, uh, built environment, all this kind of stuff. And so when the disaster actually happens, we are a key part of the equation determining how crazy it is, how messed up it is, how intense it's going to be, etc. And so, so we humans, the Anthropocene era that we've crafted of, of our plant for our planet, is really a key part of of this, and is really um, absolutely essential. So we've gone from totally God doing it all, or 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 beyond our control, to now absolutely we don't we can't predict when earthquakes are going to happen, for example. Um, but um, we now understand that um, the disaster is going to be very different today than if that same intensity, that same magnitude, that same event had happened 
a hundred years ago, or or if that same event happened in the Yukon in Alaska, as opposed to in downtown Los Angeles. Cool. Okay. Um, I think we'll take our, uh, we'll come up on our, on our hour break. So um, we'll uh, pause this um, and I'll just uh, check before we go, before we, we take our quick 10 minute break here. Uh, questions, anything about that stuff so far we've talked about? Is that making sense? Okay. All right, cool. Let's see. By my clock, I got, uh, da, 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 da. I got 8.56, so we'll come back at uh, 9.06. Give you guys a 10-minute break. So go uh, uh, turn off your camera, take a stretch, go hit the bathroom, get a coffee, and I'll see you guys back here in 10 minutes. Okay, so... Um, Right. Uh, so before our break, we talked about acts of God versus natural disasters versus this current notion of these things being um, part of the soup of our human experience on the planet. Okay, so then uh, this is the Sendai framework, um, the UN's framework for how we can organize bin um, these different types of of, of events. And I do think it's helpful. Uh, I don't think it's entirely helpful. Some things I'm not, I'm not super happy about, uh, in particular the environmental degradation part, but, but let's take a look at it. So here we go. So we have these, these natural hazards over the top, which is the vast majority of things here. Again, makes sense given the, the, the history of our conceptualization of disasters. Um, and so these are things that are primarily, uh, outside of or initiate outside of human um, direction. Human induced would be things that initiate um, directly because folks made a choice, did, did some action. And then environmental degradation is, is sort of the interaction of, of humans started it, but then you know, it's kind of, um, we, we let the marble start to roll down the mountain and then the marble's doing its own do is the thinking behind there. But, but uh, yeah. Okay, right, you guys get the idea. So, so we have the, these broad generic groups, then we have these, these particular groups, uh, and then we start getting into these, these sub-organizational uh, things. Now, all kinds of examples here. And this is, this is nice in the sense that it captures most of the things that we uh, worry about. Uh, not everything, but, but, but the vast majority. So pretty much everything that we can think about when we talk about, uh, for example, last week when you guys named disasters that you had experienced or were familiar with or whatever. Uh, I believe all of those are represented somewhere uh, in this framework. Um, having said that, uh, these are the things that um, we will uh, primarily focus on um, in our class. We may touch on other things as well, but these are the sort of the, the big heavy hitters um, of, of things. Earthquakes, tsunamis, um, uh, traditional riverine or inland flooding versus coastal flooding and sea level rise, um, hurricanes and other tropical cyclones, uh, extreme lack of water or drought, uh, wildland fires, um, vector-borne diseases like um, uh, uh, malaria and, and all these things that have so vexed us for so long, um, Lyme disease, that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, on our side, chemical spills or oil spills uh, and um, uh, radioactive release. And then, um, and then uh, yeah, sea level rise is a big one, right? All of these things are worthy of our discussion. I'm not saying that only the green things are, are important. These are just the ones that we will, um, uh, we will focus on in our class or at least, or at least spend some, some um, non-trivial time talking about. Uh, stare at this for a minute, and, and let me ask you guys, uh, it, you know, are, are there ones here that, that are not highlighted, that I've not highlighted in green, that you think are, uh, you guys would really like it if I, if I modified our schedule or adjusted our schedule and added 
added those in? Are there things you guys are particularly curious about or, or wondering about? I uh, think extreme temperatures would be good to mm -hmm. include, especially now because uh, not just like heat waves in Japan killing elderly people or in other areas where they don't have air conditioning, uh, but also uh, like in Texas, there's that there was that freak cold snap where it caused a lot of death and destruction from uh, infrastructure problems and such. Yep. Yep. Totally. Yeah. And so we will definitely I didn't plan on talking about that, but in sort of context of other things. But but um, yeah, maybe maybe we'll talk about um, extreme weather events uh, to temperature events um, as its own subject might be a good thing. Cool. Other ones you guys are hoping we would focus on or have a module on. Okay, no big deal. You guys can always, you know, pop to office hours or send me a little note. Um, but okay, cool. Um, so this, this this is our our framework of um, of how we can organize these um, these events. And uh, so our first activity of today, um, we're going to do. Uh, you guys can do a little bit of a, a, a survey of news stories. And so this is, um, I, I, I put a link in the chat to this, you don't have to cl click it quite yet, but um, these are just some recent uh, front page newspapers that I, I just grabbed um, as, as representative of what's going on. These are all front page headlines, right? So this one on the right is, um, uh, is from the current, uh, what they, we call it nor'easter, big, big intense cold winter storm um, that was smacking the Eastern seaboard of the US. And that was this bridge that that collapsed um, in the wake of the snow, et cetera. Um, other, other stories here we see uh, in the middle one, we see uh, folks uh, impacted by the fires in, in Colorado over, over the Christmas break. Uh, also there, you know, we're living through this pandemic. So there's a story about Omicron and what it's doing, how the, how the disaster is playing out in this context and the notion of, um, of schools. Uh, and on the left, we see other things, <clears throat> uh, uh, same idea here, um, but uh, uh, in particular, the front page there, there's uh, folks dealing with the um, anthropogenic stressor of pollution, right? In this case, this, this is a story about uh, uh, plastics and, and, and recycling and, and how um, different countries are, are dealing with that legacy. So, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. So um, we're gonna do two different activities today that we're gonna start with the first one. And so that link I gave you, the link that's in the chat is to a um, Google Sheet. And so we'll do this a couple times, uh, or not a couple times, we'll do this fairly frequently in our class. Either we're gonna, I'll have you guys, I'll provide you a data set, or we'll, we'll get a data set and you'll need to sort of tweak it or clean it or adjust it, or in this case, We'll, we'll craft our own data set. And so we're gonna do this by you all um, going and we'll take a few minutes and you guys are gonna uh, search the web, right? Search the web for news stories. So here's, our, here's our, our charge. So you are going to find news stories. So not, not, a, not a UN report or a, a, a you know, company website, but, but, a, but a true news story. Um, when we do these things, uh, and and I ask for you know solicit, hey guys, give me some examples of this. Just like with our scoop it posts, right? Before you post it or you can start to post it, you need to double check and look through the list. And we don't want duplicates. So so sometimes when we have some an activity like this, we're saying, hey, search for this term. Sometimes folks will, uh, you know, the most popular story will get caught, and we need we need a unique grab. So you put yours in. And then just to make sure, skim through the list and make sure nobody else um, uh, grabbed your um, story first. Generally speaking, um, this isn't always the case when we go and do searches, but for stuff like this, where we're trying to uh, take, a, take a, a random swath, um, we really wanna make sure that you guys are casting a wide net. And so that's gonna mean you're gonna want to um, take as fresh a look at or do, do as fresh a search as possible 
on this subject. So that's going to mean with your browser, you're going to go to your search engine and you want to turn off your old memory, right? So as we all know, Google and everybody loves to track us. And, and because you all are ESRM majors or in this ESRM class or students at CSUCI, right? It's going to, it's going to tend to pre-select some of the um, search results for you. And so to help with that, let's put our, our browser, our search engine, whatever the tool we're using is in some type of incognito mode. So some mode where we're ignoring our previous history. Another uh, easy way to do that is to use the search engine DuckDuckGo, which doesn't rely on, on, on tracking our previous preferences or the, or the previous types of news stories we were clicking on, et cetera. Um, and also you guys can, um, can go ahead and target news sites as well. So if you wanna um, you just sort of even avoid the whole broad random swath of internet searching, you could go to different um, uh, trusted news venues. So large national or international news organizations, the Associated Press, the New York Times, LA Times, things of that nature. And so what are we gonna do? Okay, so what we wanna do is I want you guys to search for the term natural disaster and search for the term act of God. Um, and, and the act of God is a little bit funky. So sometimes people talk about acts of God with an S in there, but, but, but one or the other. Um, and I want you guys to find six articles that specifically talk about natural disaster or acts of God or act of God or an act of God. Um, and, uh, and so let me, let me uh, uh, pause my slideshow here and call this bad boy up and show you guys what I'm talking about. Okay, so here, here's the sheet that we have. Um, and uh, we have two tabs. So for, to, for this first activity, you just need to focus on this first tab that I call Act of God. Um, and I have an example in here, right? So this example is, is filled out. Everybody, everybody's names are in here. And so you all have six natural disaster rows and six act of God rows, right? Act of God or acts of God. Um, and so you're, you're going to knock around and find some, find a story that, that refers to uh, an act of God. Now, this is not a Maybe you might get a religious site or something, right? We, we want something that has to do with a disaster um, is the other uh, thing here. So um, you don't necessarily have to read the entirety of the article, but you do need to skim it and make sure this is, this is appropriate uh, you know, for our class, et cetera. So you're going to find a story. When you find a story, um, uh, you're going to you, tell me the title of it, put the link in there, who, who what news organization published the story, the date that it was published, and then, and then this is the real, that's just sort of organizational stuff. So we make sure we don't, you know, um, aren't repeating the same story. Um, but then over here is the key stuff, which is the type of disaster. So was it a flood? Was it an earthquake? Was it a wildfire? That type of stuff. The location, was it Bangladesh or, or Canada or California or whatever? Um, and then uh, what, what community did it impact? Uh, ecological community or ecosystem. Um, and then uh, uh, any notes you want to jot down. You don't have to put in notes, but if, but if you wanted to. And so the idea here is we're going to go through this and we're going to see, hey, for, for just sort of an initial pass, um, what, were, what are the most common disasters uh, that we talk about or, or that we are articulated by using the term natural disasters? What are the type of disasters that are articulated by the term act of God? Um, and let's see if there's see if there's a difference. Maybe there is no difference. Maybe there is. So um, so that's our task. Does that make sense, everybody? Anybody have any questions for me? I am going to um, pause our recording. So taking longer than I guesstimated, which is not surprising because I always think, oh, you guys will be able to do this in a minute or so. But so um, <clears throat> uh, first, before we before we um, let me share my screen again. Um, uh, tell me about uh, just logistics. This is the first time we've done this. <clears throat> Pain in the butt, easy to use this Google Sheet approach and making sense just, just purely logistically. How is this, uh, this activity? Okay. Confusing, hard. 
It's just time consuming. That's all. Yeah, but logistically, it made sense we were doing. Yes. Other folks agree? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so let's just take a quick a quick gander. It looks like um, uh, almost everybody did the natural disaster, so that's totally cool because it was the first thing on the list, and it's totally natural. So we didn't have we don't, didn't have that many people that entered active or, or found examples of acts of God. <clears throat> so we'll have to uh, put a little pin in it, but let's just take a quick scan. So far, it looks like natural disasters. It looks like uh, uh, volcanoes, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, snowstorm, fire, snow, flood, flood, tornado. <clears throat> uh, Act of God, Max. What, what was that one you're filling out right? Oh, solar storms. Okay, so so I guess that that's uh, uh, messing with communications. Is that what that article is about, Max? Yeah, I didn't get too far into it, but I took more of the definition than the actual uh, okay. Like okay. term of Act of God, which okay. is as you posted, natural forces beyond our uh, control, and you can't really control the sun. So when the storms come, it can affect us. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, Hurricane Katrina is a, uh, <clears throat> as an example of an act of God, um, uh, this article that Giselle found is like multiple things. And so a lot of different, uh, 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 disasters there. So, okay. So at least so far, no, uh, wildfires. So it doesn't look like there's an extreme difference yet because we don't have the full data to compare earthquakes, typhoons. But it doesn't doesn't look like there's a massive difference in things that we apply the term natural disaster to, to act of God. Maybe that'll hold true. Maybe that'll evolve. But um, but uh, that that's how we're hoping to use do these types of exercises, right? To sort of have a hypothesis. Hey, is this a popular description or is this not a popular description? Are people thinking of this or are they not thinking of that? And so I um, found yeah. something because I specifically looked up. Uh, in Google, like the using the quotation marks to find the phrase act of God. Mm -hmm. A lot of the articles I saw, at least in the news tab, described uh, is either sort of three things I found. It was either refuting that something was an act of God, uh, criticizing uh, someone for using the term act of God to sort of uh, remove uh, agency and liability. Mm -hmm. And then act of God used to describe a positive uh, change, sort of a blessing rather oh, than- cool. uh, With regard rather. to disasters? Yeah, uh, well, one of them specifically I found and put on there was about uh, a wind event that removed pollution in ah. India and they okay, described cool. it as an act of God. So good. So we, we, we got all the bad stuff cleared out. Ah, oh, could, could breathe clearly, finally. So the Olympics coming to China and shutting down all their coal plants for five, for two weeks is an act of God and everybody can actually breathe. Interesting. Okay, cool. Cool. Other observations so far or other things you were starting to see as you're searching around? Sam, what'd you think? What did you think about this? Was there any patterns or not? Not really, couldn't tell any so far. Um, it's interesting, actually. Um, I well, actually, for the most part, I kept most of my article specifically just 2022. Um, but yeah, uh, one of them I found interesting was my first one was uh, earthquake in San Diego County, mm -hmm. which was kind of weird because at the time I was at my brother's place in Riverside and I actually experienced the earthquake at the lowest magnitude of it, of course. I just felt the kelp shake the most of the books on the book page fell off. I was like, oh, there's an earthquake, my first one. So that was an interesting experience. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm surprised that I was able to find an article on it. Okay, cool. Uh, Charlene, any, any initial thoughts? Anything uh, sort of jump out of you as you're starting to poke around? Well, when I typed in natural disasters into like my Google search, a lot of the stuff that came up was like uh, political, like talking about like all like policy changes or mm -hmm. stuff like that. That's a lot of the things that came up for me. Okay. Cool. All right, great. So um, so we'll we'll put a, a temporary pause in that and get 
pick up our, our lecture, but, um, um, but cool. Um, the one thing I haven't seen so far, maybe we'll see it, um, often, to, at least the stuff that I've seen, a lot of the acts of God is it often has to do with sort of um, um, the sort of accounting side of disasters. Um, because that is a that is a, a legal term in in the insurance industry, or at least with contract law, people will, will use that exact phrase. Um, in in terms of if 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 your house if, if the insurance company is going to pay for your house to get fixed or not, so if a lot of times they'll say like if you did it if you if it was a um, an action that you should have a maintenance action you action you should have taken or if or through you were negligent and something you know the candle fell over and then burned the drapes and the drapes caught the wall on fire and it burned the house up that you know they don't cover that right whereas if <clears throat> i don't know a truck was driving down the street and some sparks came out and and hit your uh uh house and caused it to burn up that's you know uh, well, that, that's a bad example. <laughs> they're they're going to sue the guy with the truck. But but if a if a lightning bolt struck your house, they would say, "Oh, that's an act of God," and so they would pay for that. So so in uh, my experience, a lot of the act of God have to has to do with the insurance industry. Yeah, M. A lot of it with the insurance that I found was involved with fires and stuff uh, yeah. of that nature. Um, yeah. Like one from the Philadelphia Inquirer, "Act of God or Felony Assault." It's about a chem. Uh, Texas chemical plant fire. There is uh, another one in India where they did make a ruling recently about specifically it has to be natural disaster cause to be ruled an act of God and not something that was just a risk of your warehouse or factory. Right. Excellent. So again, this idea of is a disaster like not caused by people? Are people in the mix? We're, we're, we're still as a society, we're still sort of struggling with this, right? Which is why we had that term act of God. We have the term natural disaster, but the, the newer phrase, we don't have a codified term. We don't all agree on that yet. We're kind of in this transition phase for that. All right, great. Well, let's, let's pick it up. Let me um, share my screen again. Um, cool. So let us pick it up here. <clears throat> okay. The let's talk a little bit about um, again by way of our introduction to this 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 field. Let's talk a little bit about um, some of the conceptual history of uh, disasters and thinking about disasters. And so, um, a, a, a recent sort of uh, paper come out a few years ago that, that sort of has pushed people to think, um, let me close this, I don't know if that blocks the screen for you guys, um, <clears throat> uh, that, that, that sort of caused a little bit of a, of a reassessment is this notion of, um, uh, we've studied disasters for some time. I'll show you some examples uh, in a sec. But um, the mo like what we would consider a modern uh, scientific approach or, or, or rigorous academic approach to looking at stuff now, many people actually uh, point to um, this, which is this 1917 event as the genesis for um, thinking about disasters systemically. And so this is uh, this is an aftermath picture. This is um, uh, up in Canada, I'm in Nova Scotia, up in Canada, and this French ship called the Mont Blanc was coming across from Europe to Canada full of all kinds of gunpowder, explosive TNT, all this, all this stuff. Essentially, it came into the harbor of this coastal town and, uh, and, and ran into, I think it was a Belgian vessel anyway, but, but sort of ran into it, had a problem, caught a little bit of fire, and the thing um, uh, soon after uh, exploded. And this was a massive explosion. So this essentially knocked everything down in a radius of about 800 meters. So, you know, half, half mile away in, 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 uh, in radius, um, killed something, almost 2000 people, which was about one fifth of the population of this town, including um, a first nation uh, uh, settlement that was sort of just on the edge of town. 
um, and injured something on the order of about 9,000 people in 1917. Um, so huge, I mean, crazy. And um, one of the people that was there that, that escaped you know, direct harm, but then rushed in to help people um, was this guy, a Samuel Prince. And so he responded, he helped, he, he um, did a lot of ministering and, and to getting people to hospitals and, and all this and that. But he was also really deeply um, impacted by this event. So much so, he, he was a bit of a nerdy dude. He already had a master's degree. And so um, uh, soon after, in 1919, he would go to Columbia University in New York and do his PhD. And he did his PhD in one year, which uh, I'll just say, bastard, uh, uh, very hard to do even today or back in the day. Um, but in any event, uh, he really cranked through it. So he was a very smart dude. He definitely knew what he wanted to, to, to study. And he was looking at, we would, we would now call this an interdisciplinary look at um, what was going on, combining the social, the, the, the human societal aspect of the disaster with the risk. And so published this as his PhD thing, not, not much happened. He sort of published it later in I think the 50s as, as sort of like a book. Um, uh, but that really um, was, people look back now as, as the first um, attempt to systematically look at what happened the disaster see what we can learn from it, see how we could um, 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 avoid the worst um, uh, repeating of this type of thing. And so, so that, um, that Halifax explosion uh, in 1917 was really sort of the, the, the beginnings of modern disaster studies. So in other words, we've had this, this type of framework, um, at least the, the, the starting of this initial framework for about a century. Um, um, now we have, uh, we can talk about all kinds of different disasters. I would say these are some of the big heavy hitters for us in the Western world. So um, in the US, let's say, the, these, these tend to be um, uh, sort of things that uh, most folks had heard of or was in the popular consciousness or had, um, had some legs, if you will. And so as, as our modern, beginning to think of what disasters are and how we talk about them, how we describe them. These are, these are um, important things. So, um, uh, and some of these we'll talk about in more depth as, as the semester goes on. Mount Vesuvius in Italy. Um, now, Vesuvius erupts all the time. The last major eruption was in the 40s, 1940s. Um, and, but, but the big one that everybody hears about or remembers um, is this 79 AD, um, uh, just huge explosion um, that uh, uh, killed a bunch of people, actually preserved a bunch of folks now. So if you watch um, some of these, you know, fantastic documentaries from Nat, uh, um, Nat Geo or, or other, um, you know, Nova, those kinds of things, these are the, this is one of the sites where the bodies were preserved because the, the, the materials from the volcano, the ash and everything um, was so intense um, and so complete that it essentially entombed uh, uh, several cities um, and villas and things of that nature. The account that we know of was from Pliny the Younger, who was not where the not exactly where the disaster was. He was a bit away, um, but nevertheless, this really was sort of at least in the Western world, this was sort of the beginnings of um, what we would come to know as the study of vol volcanoes or volcanology. Um, not a whole lot happens, at least in the, in the popular conception, for um, uh, quite some time. But we get to the 1700s and we have um, uh, some earthquakes, a series of five earthquakes actually in 1783. Um, and uh, one of the things that's done is this, it's, it, this uh, study is commissioned by the Royal Academy of Naples. And so it's, a, it's an attempt to do a, a, a not exactly systematic, but, but, but one of the first efforts to uh, go collect information and try to interpret what happened with these earthquakes. Um, in 1850, about not quite a century later, a similar kind of thing happened here. And indeed this uh, Malay, Malay would become um, uh, the father, one of the fathers of what we consider modern seismology. So the, the modern science of studying earthquakes. 
Uh, we could talk about the Great Chicago Fire in the late 1800s, um, which uh, really led to the creation of, of modern fire departments. And fire departments are really the core of our uh, responders to disasters. Um, we think of them as fire departments, but really they're, they're disaster response departments. Uh, and it also led to um, a, 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 a huge movement forward and rethinking of how we build and the regulations guiding how we put buildings together and, and, and construction approaches and things of that nature. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, amongst others, uh, would, would take a lot of um, uh, insight away from the Great Chicago Fire. Um, uh, Krakatoa eruption uh, in Java. Uh, in um, sort of the Southeast Asia region, a huge eruption, massive eruption, heard around the world actually, um, uh, and and uh, with the uh, British Empire at the time uh, so innervated around there, uh, a lot of um, uh, people in the wake of this went to go study what happened. How did it? How did it play out? The Galveston Hurricane of 1900, um, which is called the Galveston Hurricane of 1900 because we had not started naming uh, earth, uh, um, tropical storms or hurricanes as we do now. So it's sometimes called the unnamed Galveston Hurricane of 1900. Um, this still, to this day, is the deadliest natural disaster in the United States of America. So this was crazy. Um, this completely reshaped uh, coastal Texas. Um, Galveston, which was a town out on an island, uh, sort of just offshore in, um, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, town never has never recovered, um, despite what they might want you to think. Um, that was the San Francisco of, of that state. That was the big power center. There were banks and opera houses and stuff. This happened, and essentially all the power left, and they went and, and, and moved to Houston, Texas, which is now the fourth largest city in the US behind um, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. Um, it is one of the most diverse cities in the US uh, by demographics. Um, and and uh, anyway, so on and so forth. The Galveston earthquake, or excuse me, the Galveston earthquake, the Galveston hurricane, um, not only was it the most devastating um, single event in terms of the loss of life, it also radically drove forward the notion of forecasting um, and really helped um, add fuel to the fire of the just emerging uh, National Weather Service, or not just emerging, but, but, but sort of um, uh, uh, looking for its feet um, and really helped uh, interject a bunch of uh, resources, political support, et cetera, for predicting weather. Obviously, the 1906, uh, closer to home for us, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake um, and fire. Earthquake was bad, but really most of the devastation came from the, the secondary effect of um, gas lines rupturing, wooden buildings catching on fire, and the great so-called great conflagration. Uh, well, I, we already just mentioned the, the uh, French uh, munition boat that exploded up in, um, up in Canada. We could talk about uh, the Mississippi River, the, the, the massive flooding that happened in 1927. All kinds of crazy things come from there, but essentially um, uh, the efforts to um, dam rivers, the efforts to levy most of the major rivers in the United States um, and water control, flood control policies all uh, stem from that 1927 um, event and or things very closely associated with that. Uh, and then we could talk about the Dust Bowl. 1930s, um, uh, not one year, but 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 uh, uh, an era that um, just devastated uh, the middle part of the U.S., um, the prairie region, um, this area that had all been grassland that we dug up and plowed under, and then started farming using um, lame techniques and farming that were invented in Europe because people just sort of brought those over and started doing those was not conducive to soil conservation, fostered a lot of erosion, et cetera. And then this massive uh, large scale um, environmental degradation once we crossed a threshold. That would set the stage for, and, 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 the, and the need for large scale restoration uh, in the Great Depression. 
uh, and massive restructuring population wise people left um, much of that sort of Midwest area and came to places like California um, to work in uh, our agricultural fields, et cetera. So, so that's sort of a, a, a brief rundown. And somebody has a, let me check, somebody has a, something in the chat. Um, oh, yeah, M said that, oh, I didn't know that. So, so Krakatoa ins inspired the ah photo. Okay, cool, cool, excellent. That's why the background's so funky. Munch, right? Isn't it Edward? Yeah, Munch? Edward Munch. Uh, yeah. It depicts he's supposed to be the figure screaming because it's sort of uh, he was captivated by the sunset and sort of the horrific implications of it. And his friends are walking in the background of the painting. Nice. I didn't know that. I, that sounds familiar that you say that, but I, I don't I don't remember. I must have learned that at some point. But thanks. That, that's excellent. I love it. Um, yeah. So a perfect example of how these events which might be which might start in one part of the world or one part of the county or one part of our state uh, can easily have ramifications all over the place right much much farther than we might initially think uh, would be um, the case okay next let's, we need to um, get familiar with the um, and this is described differently in different uh, contexts but but the phases of a disaster, some people refer to this as, as the cycle of disaster or, or uh, the cycle of emergency response. Sometimes it's referred to as the comprehensive approach uh, to uh, risk management, disaster management, that kind of stuff. We're all talking about the same basic thing. Uh, the other, uh, by way of, of clarity, is different uh, jurisdictions, different uh, uh, settings. People sometimes talk about the three phases of this, of this cycle. Some talk about the four, some talk about five. Um, I think most commonly we will talk about, uh, people talk about four, so we'll just stick with four, realizing that, that sometimes people merge one or two or, or, or more finely divide um, one or two of these phases. So, um, right. So we would start with, um, uh, or start with, let's see. So, so it, again, this is a continuous thing. So starting is weird, but, but we would say, start around here, which would be the earthquake happens. Okay, boom, earthquake happens. We respond to the immediate event. And then once we've taken care of the immediate crises, then we go into so-called recovery mode. And then once we've recovered, we've recovered then um, we would say, oh my gosh, I didn't know we had earthquakes here, or oh my gosh, I didn't realize we could flood here or whatever. Then we'd enter a phase of, hey, maybe we're gonna flood again. So you know, what, what are we gonna do? And so we would enter a, uh, the era of mitigation. And um, you know, so, so trying to not let houses maybe be in, in, that, um, in that flood area, let's say. And then preparedness would be, uh, raising money, um, 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 creating emergency shelters, uh, creating a fire department where we fund them with, with you know, um, fast water rescue equipment, that kind of stuff. And then, you know, we kind of go on and on. So, so uh, a cycle of disaster or cycle of disaster response. So here are those four areas. Again, sometimes people pull prevention out from mitigation. Um, it, it's, I don't, I find it um, a little bit confusing as to the nuances here, but, um, but for the purpose of our class, we'll consider prevention slash mitigation as the same phase. So prevention would be any actions we take to avoid something happening. Um, uh, and, and mitigation would be um, uh, preventing or minimizing the events. So maybe we can never get rid of wildfires, but maybe we can um, uh, make it so that our houses are less likely to burn when they do come through. So prevention slash mitigation would be one phase. Uh, preparedness, again, is getting ready to handle that problem, the crisis, the disaster. Um, response is what we do as you know, in the immediate wake of the disaster and, and focus on safety focused on human life, focused on uh, securing um, a, a, a 
koala bears, that kind of stuff. And then recovery would be how we um, repair the street, how we fix the houses, things of that nature. The players that are involved in the US are at the federal level, FEMA. FEMA is a relatively recent thing. It was only created in the Carter administration. So 1970s, late 70s. Um, but, the, but that is that is the federal lead in terms of, of, of prepping for, responding to, et cetera, disasters. Then we have our state government. We have local governments, and it depends on where we are. That could be a city or that could be the county. Uh, oftentimes it's the county. Um, and then we have just the, the local folks. Uh, or this, the people that survived the disaster um, will start you know, responding and doing things and, and taking actions. And then um, after uh, the, the immediate event happens, we also have in the US a series of regional or sometimes even international, but, but, but regional volunteers, uh, church groups, uh, uh, philanthropic groups, et cetera, football teams, um, um, Girl Scouts, you know, whatever, uh, as well as, as more formal disaster NGOs like, <clears throat> like the American Red Cross and, and, and groups like that. So these folks are all playing into this um, and some, uh, you know, only work in one phase of the, of the disaster cycle. Others work in, in, in all or, or, or many phases of the disaster cycle. So a little more in depth for, for you guys' um, um, definitions, et cetera. So again, the prevention mitigation phase um, is anything that's going to try to prevent or minimize the, um, the hazard from becoming a, a disaster. And that can either be um, uh, reducing the, the, the event happening or reducing the, the negative consequences of that thing happening. So maybe we, so you can think of it, one is, is stopping all wildfire uh, or um, not stopping wildfire, but making the structures less burnable. Um, and, and prevention mitigation happened way before the disaster, uh, the onset of the disaster. That next phase, preparedness phase. Um, this is about planning for what to do, uh, where we send resources, where you go, you know, where you could evacuate to, for example, who you would call for help, who the state would call for help, that type of thing. Um, and uh, again, uh, this will this will um, uh, this won't avoid the hazard becoming a disaster, but will be better able to deal with the disaster when it happens. The response, as I mentioned before, is, is really about the safety and well-being of, of, of folks and, and property and, and, and critters and things of that nature. Key thing about response is it can last for a long time, but really the most important part is the very, very initial phase. So this is typically articulated as the first 72 hours. This is where um, we can go and get the, the horse out of the well. We can dig the baby out of the rubble in the building. And, and uh, those, those folks or those, th those, those critters are still alive. Once we get past the 72 hour phase, uh, people can still be found in, in rubble and, and et cetera, but, but it, the probability of surviving goes down dramatically. Um, because people don't have access to water, food, et cetera. So, so that's the response phase. And then the recovery phase, right, is about we've left the immediate danger, the, the proximate danger, the fire is out now. And now we need to deal with the shell, burnt shell of the house, um, um, you know, demolishing the building, putting in a new structure, that type of stuff. Um, and the key thing here with recovery is, um, the, the problems don't stop. I think sometimes in the popular conception, the storm passes, the fire blows through, and we're like, oh God, thank God we survived. And you know, yeah, thank God we survived. But but um, there's a whole host of secondary effects 
that we do, generally speaking, a poor job of quantifying. So this would be people having heart attacks because they're now having to, to walk up and down the hill or something. Um, this is, these are uh, divorces that happen because families are so stressed out financially in terms of rebuilding. This, these are people uh, going into bankruptcy because they, they've lost their job and they can't, you know, all, all these sort of secondary effects are happening in the recovery phase. And it's supposed to be, you know, conceptually, it's supposed to be the phase where, you know, we get better, but the, these disasters can have a very long tail, a very long tail. So we need to be cognizant of those secondary effects. Um, but then also, as we are recovering, what we should be doing, and I'll just say this hasn't always been federal policy, most, most conspicuously in, in the last presidential administration, um, we actively deleted any efforts to, um, to mitigate future disasters in terms of rebuilding. But what should be happening is um, as we go through this phase, not only are we trying to recover and make things better, but we should also be, be putting some serious thought into that recovery should not increase our vulnerability in the future, right? So let's so-called build back better, like those, those, that type of idea. Right to um, to uh, not have to be here five years from now redoing the same exact thing. Okay, uh, questions about that? Questions about the the response cycle, disaster cycle? Okay. Okay. Um, I'm gonna. I, we should take a, a break here, but I I kind of want to keep cranking. I'm I'm worried we might run out of time here. So um, why don't we take a quick uh. Quick uh, two minute stretch and we'll keep going. Um, uh, so just a, a quick, super quick two minute stretch, you guys. Okay, why don't we, uh, hopefully everybody stretched. I didn't stretch, let me stretch, I'll stretch. Ah, ah, ah. Okay, I've stretched, all right, good. Um, let, us, let us pick up where we left off. Um, okay, so uh, another key idea here in terms of our conceptualization of disasters is this idea, as I mentioned just there a second ago, of this idea of sort of primary and secondary impacts. Um, and so uh, a great example of this is the oil, the Peruvian oil spill that's happening right now. So this oil spill 
so we had the the as we mentioned last time we had the the um, volcanic eruption in the Pacific island of Tonga boom goes off and uh, amongst other things sets off a uh, actually huge bang that's heard you know way far away uh, atmospherically but then also in the ocean that that set off a tsunami and that wave propagated across the Pacific basin strikes Peru and one of the things that struck was this um, oil refinery run by a Spanish firm and the waves came up boom knocked some stuff broke some stuff and spilled Initially, I said, oh, just a little bit. And now um, it's every time we've heard it in the last few days, it's, it's a larger and larger volume of oil that's been spilled. And so a great example, the primary impact was obviously the tsunami itself, which inundated some harbors, you know, knocked over some boats. Um, it wasn't like, you know, the Hollywood disaster, 30 foot high wall but, but wave, but it didn't, didn't have to be, right? So, so it came across, but then the secondary impact would be this, other environmental catastrophe, right? Um, this oil spill uh, in Peru. Um, another one that I want to highlight, uh, sort of this primary, secondary, um, you know, first, second, um, is uh, this idea um, of other ways of conceptualizing a disaster. And so that that that. Emergency management cycle is often cited and it's important that we know about it and, and think about it. Um, and it's a helpful thing to do. But there are many different ways people experience disasters. In this case, this is an example um, from a couple of researchers uh, several decades ago now um, that many people have picked up on and, and, and seem to like, which is how we, how we personally respond to a disaster. So they articulate it as emotional response, but it could also be you know, just sort of psychological state, uh, et cetera. And so the axis here is, uh, you know, happy or, or positive or, or, or doing well, and then to, uh, you know, negative, sad, depressed um, on, on the bottom of this axis. And so we're going through time here. So over here, we start uh, our, our clock. And then over here on the right is, is some point in time after the event. So we start off and we're at some level of, uh, you know, this is again a, a, a generic representation here, um, but it, I have seen this played out many times uh, and I think many of us have. And so we start off and, and people maybe aren't, aren't the happiest person in the world, but they're also not the most depressed. Um, but we start off and we're at whatever level and then we, um, some disasters, not all, but some disasters, we have some forewarning. And so when that happens, people start to get a little, you know, have a little trepidation. They're a little scared. Like, oh, is this thing, I don't know. And so we start to get a little worried, worried, worried. The disaster, let's say a, a hurricane, like a looming storm that we, you know, see coming closer and closer. And oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And as it, as it uh, uh, comes to, to strike our town, let's say, um, we get more and more nervous. We get more and more scared. And then boom, the impact happens. And then assuming that, that we survived and our family survived, uh, uh, we like, whew, oh my God, we dodged a bullet and there's this, oh my God, there's a thank you, Coast Guard. Thank you, firefighters, you know, all, all that, all that jazz. And we, we get really powerful and people are baking cookies if their oven still works and they're hugging people and they're just, you know, full of love and camaraderie and everything. And we're really in this, this, uh, so-called honeymoon phase, right? Where everybody, man, I haven't seen my neighbor in in six months, but now I'm out on the porch talking to him, checking on him, making sure he's okay. And we're, we're having beers and everything. Uh, I remember one of our fires, what, what the, so many fires, when was that fire? That was probably 2013 fire. I remember in my cul-de-sac sitting out, I have some firefighters on my street or folks that work for um, firefighting agencies. And, uh, they're bringing out beers. They're like, hey, dude. I'm like, uh, I don't think we should be drinking beer as the fire is coming over the hill. And they're like, it's all good, bro. Like, yeah, it's all good. Like, yeah. Like, I, I, most of the, for some reason, most of the firefighters I know seem to be surfers, but, um, but uh, they're like, it's all good, you know. And, you know, it was, it was this um, uh, very much almost, almost like a party, not, 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 not a, not a, not a hooray, the fire is coming, but, but a sense of everybody was together and everybody was looking out for each other. So that honeymoon phase. Then um, pretty rapidly, once the, 
the adrenaline burns off. And once, once we sort of inventoried what's been broken and, and who's missing and that kind of stuff, then we start to get the press like, oh my God, I can't believe that blah, blah, blah passed away. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we're going to have to rebuild the fence or, or whatever the case may be. And then uh, you enter uh, into, uh, so the steepness of this oftentimes seems to have something to do with the, the scale. So if it was a fire that burned my house, I would go through something like this, but it would be relatively mellow. As the disaster, uh, as the event goes from an emergency to a disaster, uh, it, gets, it gets harder. And then if it were to be a major catastrophe, right? It, it, this is real, can be really steep after that honeymoon phase, right? And, um, and we're like, why, why is it so hard to get a loan to fix my fence? And I can't afford the hotel rooms anymore and all that kind of stuff. And we enter this era of disillusionment. So we start to think, man, our society sucks. Man, our government doesn't work. Man, nobody cares for me. Man, my family doesn't support me. You know, all those different emotional uh, things. And key as we go through here, there's different triggering events and different, different um, uh, uh, things, oftentimes uh, associated with an anniversary. So it's been one month, it's been six months, it's been one year, what have you. And that leads to ups and downs. Um, and uh, eventually, when we are able to recover and restore uh, our home, our business, um, the habitat, whatever the case may be, the farm, um, then we get to a, a sort of new outlook. Um, and a lot of folks uh, maybe have a more positive view. Um, you know, they say things like, <clears throat> you know, it's only, it's only things, it was only, th I, I wish I had my wedding album, but you know, it's only things, I'm so stoked to have my family, that kind of stuff. That doesn't, not everyone ends up more positive, but, but this sort of arc of, of ups and downs and, and high swings up and high swings down is very common. And that's a totally valid way to also conceptualize disasters. Questions or any thoughts on that? Okay. Um, so we have that, so we have the um, sort of primary and secondary effects of, of disaster. We could also talk about um, uh, the actual disaster itself and, and how temporally how that plays out. And that can be a key thing. So sudden would be the earthquake or the wildfire uh, uh, versus something that takes a long time to play itself out. So for example, here is um, uh, a classic example of something like a, a hurricane. Um, we call in when stuff hits um, the US in our part of the world, we call them hurricanes. And in um, other parts of the world, we call them typhoons, same exact thing, just, just different name for different, different area, uh, but same phenomenon. So here's an example, uh, November 7th, people identify uh, this, um, this typhoon as one of the strongest we've ever measured. Um, it was called Haiyan. When it gets to the Philippines, that people there call it Yolanda, but but same, it's the same same storm. And so, oh my gosh, it's we just recognize it. It just formed, and it's super super strong. The next day, it hits the Philippines, kills six thousand people, injures about thirty thousand people, displaces about four million people. On the eighth of November, and then the next day, it's gone. It's heading off to to wherever it went to Cambodia and Vietnam and that kind of those other places. So this disaster didn't exist. Oh my God, it's here. And then boom, it's gone. So the secondary effects did not end on that day, but, 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 the, but the primary event of the, the catastrophe uh, uh, happened over the course of, you know, essentially 24 hours to the people of the Philippines. In contrast, we could talk about something like a climactic a disaster, uh, and the classic thing would be here was something like a, like a, a, a drought. And so August 2010, um, the modelers start to see the climactic modelers start to say, "Oh my gosh, looks like we're headed for some very dry times for a large chunk of the continent of Africa." And uh, within you know 11 months or so, um, we are into severe drought, striking 
um, all across the Horn of Africa. Um, and this intense drought lasts for um, about a year, very, very intense. And so by the time September, uh, by, the, by, by September of 2012, more than a million people had um, fled uh, the Somalia and were in camps in neighboring countries of Kenya and Ethiopia, right? So, so that disaster played itself out over a year as opposed to 24 hours. And so um, these, how the disaster plays out will have obviously particular ramifications for how we mount a response, how we can start recovery. If we're still in the middle of a disaster happen, we can't, you know, we can't technically recover. Um, so primary or secondary, sudden, slow uh, uh, impacts. Another key theme here is vulnerability. Um, the more we go to, from emergency to disaster to catastrophe, the greater we exacerbate existing social vulnerability among whatever dimension you want to choose. If you want to talk about financial issues, if you want to talk about um, educational attainment, if you want to talk about um, whatever, uh, diabetes, health risk, whatever. Um, and so uh, we talk about vulnerable populations in particular, we most tip in the context of disasters, we're most typically thinking about elderly folks, disabled folks, uh, uh, low income folks, and in the case of the US, non English speakers. So each of these groups, there's particular challenges with getting information to them, um, uh, uh, getting them to physically relocate or, or get out of harm's way. Um, the, their ability to uh, deal with the immediate effects of the disaster and then the uh, uh, you know, recovery phase and in, in, in the, the post onset um, phases of this stuff. While we do need to think about the norm, we can't, we can't only talk about elderly folks in the context of disasters, right? That doesn't make any sense. But, but in addition to thinking about the average person in our community, um, or average critters in our landscapes, we also need to think about the people and the organisms that are most marginalized, that are most tenuous. And it turns out um, thinking about disasters and, and thinking about groups that are vulnerable is very similar, there's a very similar overlay to groups that are um, uh, threatened by climate change and the climate crisis. So, so those are almost, they're not entirely, but they're, they're almost, the exact same uh, populations oftentimes. And we can ask questions like, uh, who doesn't have homeowner's insurance? Uh, uh, who can't jump into their own private vehicle to get away, right? Um, who doesn't have a cell phone to get emergency alerts? Um, um, uh, who doesn't have enough savings or who doesn't have a, a credit card with a, a lot of um, you know, bandwidth to charge stuff to pay for a hotel right now? Um, who um, has been, uh, you know, marginalized from their family um, because of some other life choices uh, or, or just life circumstances. And um, they don't have that network they can return to uh, for, for emotional support, financial support, um, and the like. So, so um, we do need to think about uh, uh, non-vulnerable folks, but we also absolutely need to specifically think of vulnerable populations in our planning, response, et cetera, for disasters. Um, and then I wanna to touch on uh, some disaster myths. So there's many more disaster myths. These are just a few. Um, and, uh, and this was gonna be our, our, our next exercise. And I think I'll, I'll have this, I'll, I'll convert this to be an exercise that we'll do um, this week. And it'll be due on, due on, uh, on Friday at five. So, um, so that first part that we, we worked on, this, is, this was designed to be the second part, um, but let me just first describe what's going on here. So these are, these are common disaster myths that we see um, repeated over and over again in the, in the popular um, conceptualization. You'll see it in you know, uh, television TV series or Hollywood blockbuster disaster flicks um, or um, in non-careful reporting 
um, that kind of stuff. So first, so I'll just I'll just run through these really quickly since we're getting uh, tight on time here. Um, but uh, this would include things like people panic. Oh my God! Like the earthquake happens and everybody runs around screaming and oh my God, the chaos. Rarely does that happen. Rarely does that happen. People are amazingly calm usually in the in disasters, uh, uh, comparatively speaking. Um, uh, there's also this sense that, or, or this this thinking that disasters bring out the worst in us, and people are going to go loot stores and all this and that. Um, all these things do happen, but but by and large, there is not widespread looting. By and large, people don't lose their s, right? People people don't you know stab each other and run away from each other. Generally speaking, people help each other out. Um, we also love, especially in the U.S., we love this. And especially in Hollywood, we love this idea of the lone hero. It's usually a dude, usually a dude with a square jaw and a lot of muscles, oftentimes flying a helicopter or something, right? And, and they're like, the hero comes and saves a day. And to be sure, there are lots of fantastic folks doing, doing wonderful things in the wake of disasters, but we really seem to focus on um, that person as opposed to the, I don't know, the lady in the, um, uh, distribution uh, uh, warehouse, getting the water pallets out to people so they don't, uh, you know, don't dehydrate, right? But yet, she's busting her, she's she's just busting her butt and doing all this huge work. But yet, um, you know, a macho dude flies in on some kind of technology, and they're like, "Yeah, hero." Um, uh, the notion that survivors are helpless and they're just sitting around waiting for aid. Of course, some people are are sitting around waiting for aid because they're so destitute or so impacted. But by and large, most people do not think of themselves as helpless. They need, they might need some help, but they are actively doing things, cleaning up their property, um, um, tending to their, their neighbors, that kind of stuff. The notion that disasters cause, cause epidemics. Disasters can absolutely cause epidemics, but rarely, rarely do they in terms of the, the overall grand scheme of things. So um, epi epidemics are not necessarily a consequence of just simply having a disaster. There, there tends to be this impression that things return to normal fairly quickly, let's say within a few weeks. That just doesn't ever happen. Um, this notion that uh, the goal should always be to replicate the pre-disaster conditions. You always hear this, right? Like, well, we're totally going to rebuild and we're going to you know, be back and stronger than ever. And, and um, rarely do we rebuild exactly the way we did before. In fact, that would, in many cases, be a foolish thing, right? Because we would be replicating our vulnerability, right? If we had to do it exactly the way um, we were before. Um, and then with regards to the, the um, you know, once we're doing the cleanup and all this and that, there's huge focus on um, fraud. Oh my God, we can't give these, these folks money because they will just steal it. People are just evil, right? Um, and, and so we have to have all these institutions and we have to have all these guarantees and we have to have all these safeguards and safe checks so that nobody commits fraud as opposed to flooding the area with money. And in my experience in disasters, what we need to do is flood the area with money um, to get people as much help as possible, as fast as possible. Um, but this, this myth has really um, caused us all kinds of problems in, in New Orleans and elsewhere. And so, um, so the activity, oh, sorry, questions about that. Any questions about this stuff so far? Again, these are just a few, we, we could, have a long list of disaster myths, but I'd say these are some of the most common ones that I've seen. There's a good uh, push, maybe not in like news cycles and news stories and such, especially not um, in places like Fox News, but changing sort of the narrative about the looting, especially in the face of disasters, um, more uh, reframing it that people just need resources or they will die. And that's sort of a last uh, uh, a last minute decision. Yeah, I mean, to be sure it is, it was the case that some people like say after Katrina that some people stole some flat screen TVs, absolutely that happened, but that was a super small part of the story, right? D just like Em was saying, most people that went into stores 
were getting diapers for their kids because their kids needed diapers or, or, or water bottles because their daughter was thirsty. You know, it, 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 it absolutely. Um, uh, and in fact, a lot of that soul searching came in the wake of Katrina uh, because, because that's how things were articulated. And then people later like went and looked and said, was well, this the right way to explain this or, or what have you? including okay, cool. um the tvs and stuff stuff like that um is usually stolen so they can later sell it because you know their home is disaster as has been destroyed so that um comes in with the stealing and fraud thing that people are expecting there to be safeguards on relief and recovery efforts that they won't get so they steal uh expensive items so that they can you know take take the initiative and try to recover themselves. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, uh, absolutely. I would also say that there are a-holes out there that do do that, but but again, the they are the minority. They are, they are not the norm um, or, or the most common uh, group of folks. Cool. Okay, o other thoughts or other, other comments about any of that stuff? Okay, cool. Um, so uh, again, I will I will create this as an assignment. But the next thing we we're going to do was, uh, and what you will do is the same kind of thing as before on that other tab. Um, so you'll finish uh, populating the the first sheet, and then the second uh, tab, same thing. Your names are there, etc. Here I've listed uh, these myths, right? So just I haven't listed the full name, but you know people panicking, people looting, uh, people are just waiting for aid, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and there's a column for each of those. And so uh, I want you to find six examples of this. So si six examples of people um, explicitly talking about these myths or, or strongly implying that these myths are, are what will happen if, uh, you know, if it's the early phase of a disaster, let's say. Um, and so I want you to find six, and they have to be in at least two different categories. So I don't want I don't want all six to be about panic. Um, you could pick you could do one for each one if you wanted to, or but but um, at least two separate ones, a total of six. Same thing. You'll find a story, put it in there, um, and and, uh, and and explain it. And and uh, uh, there's a column, and wherever there's there's a column, you can just put put a little an X or a one in there. So that I know, oh, okay, so this one is about a hero or this one's about um, a fraud in recovery kind of thing. And, uh, and, and so, so, so I'll have you guys fill those out, uh, finish both those sheets by, uh, by Friday, and we'll probably talk about them uh, next week in class since we, we um, aren't going to be able to talk about them right now. Um, okay, so and then just to wrap up, I'll just say that... Uh, We've had, uh, we are experiencing, as you've seen from the readings and as you'll see across the semester, um, the occurrence of disasters is increasing. So we're seeing an increase in magnitude and an increase in the frequency of these things. And so um, for a variety of reasons, things like climate change are making um, events more crazy droughts more intense, um, hurricanes more frequent, that type of thing. But that's not it. So a lot of times people will say that it's climate change. Absolutely climate change is a part of it, but there are many other things as well, including just the total number of people that are on the planet right now, right? Um, so the sheer number of human beings are making us experience more and be exposed to uh, more people be more exposed to disasters. Also, people have cha we've changed historically where we live. So we are increasingly living in places that are more dangerous, that are more, we are more vulnerable to, ex to these hazards. Um, living on the coast, uh, living in a floodplain, living in a community that is on the wildlands urban interface and so potentially exposed to wildfire and and on and on on and on the other thing um that that's that's underappreciated you guys had some readings on this um 
this week is this notion of um, just the very nature of our systems are much more complex. So you can imagine an old wooden barn from 100 years ago. And if we had a wildfire come through, that would be bad. That would suck. Our barn would burn up and it'd be gone. But we could relatively easily re replace that barn as opposed to a modern I don't know what we'd say, a modern warehouse, right? Where we store our, our factories. So we have electricity, we have water, we have a cement pad that we need to be re-poured. Um, we have, you know, internet, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. So our, our human society right now builds and designs ever more expensive and ever more complex structures. And so that makes the consequences of these disasters more intense, more costly, uh, and more difficult to recover from. Um, so all this together is part of the picture where disasters seem more ominous, ominous and indeed actually are more ominous um, and problematic as we've gone through time. Cool. Questions? <laughs>